Hi, Gideon. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm very well. How are you? I'm very well myself. Very happy to be talking to you. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Gideon Rosen, professor of philosophy at Princeton University, and also you are chair of the department. Is that correct? That is true, yes. And, you know, the Princeton philosophy department, it has been the case for decades that if you look at one of these lists, you know, 10 best philosophy departments in the world, Princeton is always there. So I would think that the chair of the Princeton philosophy department is a very powerful man. Oh, you would be wrong about that. Really? So, but you do get to tell the professors what their positions will be on the big philosophical issues. I assume. Oh, I, I do. And they, and they comply. I the power to ignore my advice. Mm-hmm. Well, Anyway, uh, I'm really excited about this because uh, I should confess that you and I are friends. And I've been trying to get you to be on this show for years. You've resisted. But the reason I've wanted you to is that whenever I have a question about philosophy, you provide a very efficient overview of the whole context of my question. You don't always provide a definitive answer, but that's in the nature of philosophy. It is. It's a shame that it's in the nature of philosophy. It would be nice if we could wheel out definitive answers to these questions, and it's a bit of a mystery why we can't, since everybody else manages to provide the occasional definitive answer. Uh, we don't. It's a drag, but uh, we do our best. Do you think it's a mystery, or do you think it's just kind of clear, given the nature of the questions you address, why it would be the case? that you don't come up with, you know, the same kinds of question answers that mathematicians and scientists do? Yeah, there's some obvious differences that explain why we don't do it the way they do. But if the questions make sense, if the questions are clear, then they have answers. And we don't have a clear sense of why it is that we can't nail them down. It's not as if we're floundering around. Philosophy produces plenty of... Um, opinion, plenty of conviction, even plenty of uh, justified conviction in the sense that people have arguments for their views and arguments that some people find persuasive. What we don't get is much consensus on the hard questions, even given the arguments we've got. And that's a little mystifying. I suppose so. Uh, I don't know. I want to give you more credit. I think you're just tackling the hard questions. <laughs> um, let me let me say a little more about you. Uh, you are, I gather you came up uh, with, there's this thing called modal fictionalism in philosophy. You came up with that, right? That's your thing. Yeah, that was my thing for a That's while. Your thing. And so like if people Google that, they will see your name. If anyone else claims to be the modal fictionalism guy, they are lying, right? Because you yeah, are. That's great. Yeah. So also you wrote uh, a subject with no object, strategies for nominalist reconstruel in mathematics. Uh, did you co-author that? Or, yeah, that's co authored with, with John Burgess, John Burgess, Oxford University Press. Yes. The people who have questions about nominalist reconstruction and mathematics know who to talk to. You actually did start out, uh, you've done a lot of different kinds of philosophy, including like legal philosophy and so on, but you started out in mathematical philosophy, is that right? Yeah, in the sort of metaphysics and epistemology of mathematics. So mm -hmm. I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a mathematical logician, I'm not the kind of philosopher who contributes um, theorems to the subject. But uh, Mathematics raises these very basic philosophical questions about what the subject matter of mathematics is, how we know about it, and so on. And that was the stuff that grabbed me for a while. And still yeah, does. that's heavy. That's heavy. So what I want to, um, we may get back to that before this is all, there's so much we could talk about, but I did want to start out on the question of materialism, or as I guess it's more or less interchangeably called physicalism, um, you know, that's, uh, let me give you the crude definition, and then you can correct me. Um, but, you know, I, it's in some sense the idea that everything that there is, is physical, it's material stuff. Uh, the question matters, or at least is seen as mattering by a lot of people, including people of a religious or spiritual persuasion. I think they often uh, think of uh, the worldview of materialism as being antagonistic to their worldview. Um, and, and a lot of people see it as, I think, kind of maybe depressing, or at least uh, uh, some of these people do. You know, and, and 
a question arises as to like how what is the status of of that of the worldview of materialism within philosophy uh you know you could for reasons we could get into you could imagine that the history of physics over the last 100 years 150 years would have called into question some of the at least simpler forms of materialism physicalism so why don't you start out by telling me what you think of the the words you know as meaning physicalism materialism and then and then uh we can get into their the status of the idea all right so we Hard-headed philosophers who were impressed by the scientific worldview used to call themselves materialists. That's because they thought that what science had shown is that at the fundamental level, absolutely everything is made of matter, where matter is something that we have a pretty good ordinary idea of. We know what rocks are like, we know what clay is like. That stuff takes up space, it's spread out, it has geometrical properties, it's impenetrable and so on. Um, the rocks and the clay of ordinary experience may have other features too, like color and smell, which are a sort of subjective contribution on our part. But you abstract from that, and what's left is this pretty clear conception of material stuff with geometrical properties that takes up space and has properties like mass and so on. And for a long time, physics seemed to be saying everything at the fundamental level is like that. It's just geometrical space occupying stuff, maybe spread out in some empty space. Mm -hmm. That was materialism. And that was the received view of what physics or physics and chemistry had shown about nature for a long time. And then that view started to fall apart in the middle of the 19th century. Because what physics then seemed to be saying was, it's not all like that. There is, for example, the electromagnetic field. The electromagnetic field is not like a rock, mm -hmm. spread out, it's everywhere, it's thin, it's filmy, the features that scientists attribute to it aren't features like, you know, bang on the table, impenetrability. So physics is telling you that that's what nature is like at the most fundamental level. It's not telling you that nature is material at the fundamental level, but it is telling you that nature is physical at the fundamental level. And then but, there's- but, but then what does the term mean at, at that point? It's pretty hazy. It's partly negative. They are still telling you that at the fundamental level, real things, including the electromagnetic field or the more complicated fields that you get in modern physics, um, don't think that there is no mind or spirit or soul or anything like that at the fundamental level, that there is no value or meaning or anything like that at the fundamental level. There is no consciousness or anything like that at the fundamental level. Fundamental Whatever the level. electromagnetic field is like, it doesn't have those features. Okay, so at this That's point... That's the negative conception of what the physical would be. At this point, what we mean by fundamental comes into question, of course. Uh, but but <laughs> before we get to that, assuming we ever do, let me... Um, I mean, there's a lot there. I mean, one thing... But, but let me do, before we get to that, let me just say that one thing I would have retreated to, like if I were like trying to defend materialism in the light of these developments in physics, is I would say, well, what it really means is that the world is a regular, predictable place. And these, um, you know, these concepts like a field and so on, they're kind of these aspects of reality that permit us to make the predictions and in that sense affirm the predictability they're part they're part of the gears like of the universe and so and it's by understanding them that we are able to predict it so i might have said what we really mean is regularity no like spooky interventions that are in principle unpredictable and so on right is that not a satisfactory retreat i think it's a little bit less and a little bit more than what physicalism is supposed to be. So for a time around the beginning of the 20th century, philosophers and some scientists played with the idea that at the fundamental level again, what you have instead of material objects spread out in space is a set of 
mental qualities spread out in a mental space. This view is called phenomenalism. The world is really an array of colored shapes, like the colored shapes you experience when you open your eyes and have a visual experience, and not a bunch of invisible particles with geometrical or mathematical so, the, so then color is just not a takeaway of ours from the material world. It's actually there. That's right. So this was a view that the objects of immediate experience, which were sometimes called sense data, are real things that exist independently of our awareness of them. They occasionally come into view, but that's what reality is like at the fundamental level. And the world of physics is a kind of superstructure that we derive from that. These philosophers didn't deny that at the fundamental level, nature was regular. They thought there would be laws governing the evolution of the sense data or the phenomenal qualities. So they believed in regularity at the fundamental level, but they weren't physicalists. Mm -hmm. And what is, was different. what is the connection of these people to, broadly speaking, like idealism as most famously embodied, I guess, in Berkeley? Who, who, who thought, you know, the whole question of, I mean, I mean, are they really doing a fundamental inversion and, and saying, well, what's most fundamental is actually consciousness, subjective experience, and what we think of as the material world is a construct or, or what? Yeah, they, I mean, so this is a subtle point. These guys, I'm thinking of Bertrand Russell at certain point, at points, oh, really? also, William, also William James. Um, hmm who converged on similar ideas around the same time. Unlike the idealists like Barclay and maybe Hume, they did not think that the objects we're aware of in sensory experience, the colored bits and pieces that you entertain, depend on the mind. Mm. They thought that they were there anyway. Mm. And Consciousness is a relation to them. You become aware of them, but consciousness doesn't create them. They're not creatures of consciousness. So they thought that the world was independent of consciousness, but was sort of fit to be revealed to consciousness as it actually is. So when you open your eyes and see the world, you don't see some image or some illusion or some misleading mentally constructed picture of reality, you see some fragment of reality, the array of colored shapes that you're aware of. So those guys weren't physicalists, they weren't idealists either. They sometimes called themselves neutral monists. Hmm. There was only one fundamental stuff. It was this stuff that we are immediately aware of and experience, but it wasn't in the physical chemists sense. It's almost physical. hard for me to imagine what they're saying. I mean, in other words, yeah, the color is inherent in the apple in the sense that it, it, it has the physical properties such that when light bounces off of it and interacts with the parts of my eyeball, I have this conscious experience. They're clearly not just saying that, right? No, they're not just saying that. They're saying that although that story of color perception is certainly correct as a matter of psychophysics, as a matter of metaphysics, that process that we just alluded to is a process by means of which some parts of the phenomenal world become aware of other parts of the phenomenal world. So you or your brain or whatever it is considered at the most fundamental, this is a crazy view, I should say. This is not a view that some people, I guess, take this seriously now. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that Russell, uh, I had always thought of him as a pretty pretty concrete, sober, meat and potatoes, conservative thinker, but maybe I'm wrong. Russell was an extremely ambitious metaphysician. Hmm. He was, um, he's responsible in large part, not in whole part, for the intense respect with which mathematical physics and so on is regarded by philosophers. But he himself was totally open to the idea that at the fundamental level, reality was so freaking weird that physics wasn't going to disclose it to us. Mm. That seems possible to me that there's a level of fundamentalness that we will, that we are, seems almost likely. <laughs> I mean, given the process that created us, natural selection. Uh, wow. Okay. So there's that, but then that kind of passed away. Um, and I'm not sure I totally get it, but it's not idealism. It's not 
it's not the idea that that in some sense consciousness is more fundamental than the physical world. Right. It's you could put it like this: the objects of consciousness mm -hmm. are more fundamental than the physical world, but not consciousness of them. That I mean, so yeah, we shouldn't. Mm. You know, we shouldn't give this to you more. Credit. Right. Right. Okay. So that's interesting. So what? But okay. So you're right. It gets. It gets. One thing I'd say is like it gets. Um, so physics makes what you might call naive or simple physicalism increasingly problematic. At some point, it threatens even the version I threw out that that you use these people to question the idea that we just mean regularity by physicalism, which is you know with quantum physics, we get to the idea that. Um, actually, according to mainstream interpretation, or, uh, there are truly unpredictable things in the universe. Things happen in the universe for which there is no cause in the universe. There's no predicting them. In the long run, the odds, they, they even out. Head, number of heads equals number of tails, so to speak. But still, it's not regular in the conventional. So that's a further... Is, this, is quantum physics thought of as posing a distinctive and new kind of danger to the worldview of materialism i wouldn't have thought that the the indeterminism that may be part of quantum physics is a threat to materialism it should always have been an open question how regular or law governed the material world was it was a sort of real surprise of classical physics that it looked like the sprawling complexity the incredible chaos and hodgepodge that we observe in physical nature is in fact governed by strict deterministic laws. That's how it seemed to physics. But that was a sort of, that was a shocking possibility. As that began to fall apart with 20th century physics, a, a materialist or a physicalist should have said, ah, so it turns out that the physical world, which is the only real world, is a little more chaotic or a little more indeterministic than we had suspected. Mm -hmm. The metaphysical view is still fine. It's mm -hmm. just that the laws have a different kind of probabilistic character. Yeah, of course, it was true that in the early days of quantum mechanics, people thought that for other reasons, there was some tension between physics and physicalism. And they, no longer, they, don't, think that that is, they don't think that anymore? Well, they thought that consciousness had to play a special role in the dynamics of quantum mechanics. Right. You know, the cat's only determinately alive. Right. Yeah. That, that, that the observation forces reality into definite existence. Right. So that was a view that was apparently held, though I guess it's a controverted historical question whether the uh, architects of quantum mechanics really held it. But anyway, that was a view that seemed to emerge from... Uh, mid 20th century physics that would have elevated consciousness to this very special role in the cosmos. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think uh, that view is especially current these days. Yeah. In, in physics, I don't think that many people hold that the actual conscious observation of the measurement as opposed to the physical measuring apparatus brings, uh, right. brings resolution. Um, so then what, uh, so where are we? You once said something to me that like kind of given, so it is, it is, so is the current status that it's harder to defend materialism or than it was a hundred years ago or harder to even say what it means or what? And what is the, what is the kind of landscape of opinion within philosophy in terms of like what percentage of philosophers would, would say, yes, I'm a, I'm a proud materialist. So there is, a lingering, slightly embarrassing question about how to formulate physicalism. If you're going to sign on to it, you should have a clear statement of it. The thing I said before, at the fundamental level, nature is consciousness-free, mind-free, value-free. That's kind of negative. It doesn't bring out what all of the physical stuff, as physical stuff, is supposed to have in common. What, what do the particles of 17th century atomism and the quantum fields of 21st century physics have in common that makes them genuinely physical entities. It's a little hard to say. So there's this embarrassment about uh, what exactly we're signing on to when we say at the fundamental level, everything is like that. But I think the main sticking point isn't this definitional thing. How do we formulate physicalism? It's that there seem to be aspects of reality that can't be fit into a physicalist picture of the world. Um, 
<coughs> just to mention one that's not so central to the debate. So I'm not a physicalist because I think that mathematical objects are real. That is, I think that the subject matter of pure mathematics, the numbers and functions and um, sets and algebras and spaces with which pure mathematics is concerned, I don't think those are parts of the natural world at all. I don't think they're spread out in space. I don't think that they have properties like mass or electric charge or anything like that. But mathematics is a body of knowledge, so it must have a subject matter, and its subject matter must exist. So because that subject matter is, as far as I'm concerned, obviously not part of the physical world, I wouldn't call myself a physicalist. I believe in mathematical entities, too. That's not the sort of sexiest reason for rejecting physicalism, but it's one that I take. No, I, don't, I think there are people who will be disappointed if that's the only reason you're... Although it's, it's interesting to me that you see those two as intention. I mean, I know there's this old debate about whether you know, kind of in some platonic sense or something, mathematical truths are out there. I've never been able to totally wrap my mind around the question. It, it, it's also kind of related to the fact that you early, earlier said something you, you just kind of repeated, which is that part of the idea of, of, of physicalism is that, you know, the fundamental stuff out there is, is just physical. There's no value out there, or the, right? I mean, you know, here we're talking about the concept kind of of moral realism. Are moral laws and truths, do they have kind of some kind of reality? Um, I wouldn't, you know, I would have thought that you can defend a version of moral realism without asserting that moral truths like occupy space, like as if they're competing, you know, <laughs> with atoms, right? And, and, and I kind of have the same, well, I, I yeah, I guess in, well, anyway, do you, do you see the, the issue I'm raising with respect to kind of to both the math question and the, the moral realism question? Yeah, though I do think they're slightly different. Yeah. So the math question is a question about things that, if you think about it, nobody ever thought that those things were parts of the natural world. If you believe in them at all, they were, you know, a separate sort of category and so mm -hmm. on. So when people are arguing about physicalism, that stuff's not what's on their mind. They want to talk. Physicalism, you might think, is a view about what nature is like. What's there in the natural world, the world of space and time? Is it all physical? That stuff about numbers is not a direct address to that question. The moral realism question, on the other hand, is. So here, you know, picture some um, morally hideous human action. You've got some human beings doing painful medical experiments on cats for the cosmetic industry. Right, so just picture it. You can give a scientific description of what they're doing, how their bodies are moving, what's going on in the bodies and brains of the animals they're interacting mm -hmm. with. And then there is the fact that what they're doing is wrong, that there's a moral standard that they are violating in doing this. Mm -hmm. That claim attributes a further property to that human action, in addition to the properties that a psychologist or a physiologist might take an interest in, the action has a moral property, the property of being wrong. Mm -hmm. If that property is fundamental, if we cannot somehow reduce the wrongness of the act to other more basic features about what it causes and what its effects are and so on, then there's a feature of a natural object, the human action, that isn't a physical feature, moral wrongness. And if that's true, then physicalism is false. Because physical entities, natural entities, it, have features that physics doesn't capture. If it's inherent in physical phenomena that they're right or wrong, then physicalism is inadequate, you're saying, because inherent in means it's part of them. And, and physicalism doesn't account for any non-physical part. Exactly. That's right. So if the wrongness is irreducible, then in a certain sense, physicalism is false. Because there's more to the natural world of events unfolding in space and time mm -hmm. than a morally neutral physical theory like quantum mechanics or mm -hmm. anything else that gets served up in the physics department, the chemistry department, or the biology department mm -hmm. would describe. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm willing to buy that, but I guess, and, 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 but 
I guess if I were going to try to articulate an objection, and, and this would maybe embody the, the math question as well, which would just be that um, leave aside math, leave aside uh, morality, when we just describe what's going on in the physical world, obviously the description itself is not part of the physical world. So, so um, if, you know, if that's going to be sufficient to dismiss physicalism, then physicalism should have surrendered a long time ago because obviously we make statements about uh, the world and those statements are not part of the world. The part of, they're part of the world, but they're not part of what we're talking about. They're not part of the physical system we're talking about, right? So it seems to me like math and moral assertion and sheer description are all things that uh, exist by virtue of our being uh, uh, observers and articulators, right? But the physicalists will say um, the descriptions you produce, they could be marks on paper, they could be sounds in the air, they could be um, representations in your brain. They are part of the physical world. And it's true that fundamental physics doesn't talk about things like that, but linguistics does and audiology does. And eventually all of those sciences are just capturing complex features of the physical world. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that descriptions emerge that's the challenge to physicalism. It's when you get features of the world that really can't be, as far as we can tell, uh, reducible to or fully captured in terms of right. the kinds of things that do show up in physics and chemistry. It's unclear whether there's anything in the theory of representation, linguistics, cognitive psychology and so on it's problematic there yeah i mean certainly one distinction is if i may if i describe the physical world the truth or falseness of my description should in principle be determinable unambiguously by examining the physical world we wouldn't say the same thing about moral claims but you know math is interesting because all of its application is to the physical world it, it certainly its roots historically arise from observing the physical world and trying to figure stuff out. But you, you, you so, so what is it that makes you think that, that there's some part of math that's kind of out there beyond the physical world? So two rather different kinds of things. One is that it's true that, for example, um, geometry was originally the study of physical space or objects in physical space. Um, and there wasn't much of a difference between geometry and um, the physics that employs the geometry. So if you had asked Archimedes what he did, it would have been not so different from what the geometers were doing. Um, but with the discovery of non-Euclidean geometry, it became clear that the study of mathematical geometry is one thing, the study of physical geometry is another. So Euclidean geometry is still good mathematics, even if the physical space we inhabit is not Euclidean. So at that point, mathematics becomes no longer the study of physical structures. It's the study of pure mathematical structures, which may sometimes be more or less perfectly realized in the physical world. And the other thing is that mathematics is thoroughly, completely up to its ears committed to um, the infinite. The structures that are of most mathematical interest are wildly infinite, mm -hmm. huge, huge by comparison with anything that could fit in ordinary nature, as far as we know. Mm -hmm. so if you think that the infinite is real, then you think that what we study when we study the infinite probably isn't anywhere instantiated in physical nature. Mm -hmm. So what about, I mean, as a, um, as a challenge to physicalism, I mean, we've, we've kind of touched on this, but, but, just the very existence, if you think it exists, of consciousness. I mean, you know, it is, uh, I think almost all of us believe that there is such a thing as subjective experience. It's like something to be us. Therefore, we have consciousness. Consciousness and subjective experience are nouns, right? They're... they're, they're it's not the same as, although I think some philosophers have claimed it is, uh, saying that when you see a person running, right, the, 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 the runningness, how is that different from consciousness? Well, I think it actually is, damn it, for reasons I'm not sure I'm prepared to articulate, but, but I do, don't you, I assume a lot of philosophers would say 
that yes, consciousness, subjective experience deserve to be nouns in a, in a, in a deep and significant sense that arguably could be a challenge to physicalism. Yeah, I think the challenge arises even if you're not to, um, if you don't lean on the idea that consciousness is an abstract now. Uh -huh. um, before we start um, reifying or making a thing out of consciousness as itself, as if consciousness were like um, milk or styrofoam, this sort of substance that we somehow have to account for, just start with the idea that people are conscious. When I say that you are conscious, that you have a certain conscious experience or that it feels a certain way at a certain time to be you. I'm not reifying consciousness as stuff when I say that, but I am attributing a feature to you. Mm. The feature that you possess when you are tasting pineapple, say for the first time. At that moment, you're the subject of an event, an episode, the experience itself. And that experience may, in some sense, be constituted by an event in your brain, an event that a neuroscientist could study. But it looks like when you have that experience, you are aware of other features of it, its distinctive feel. Those features need to be located somehow in the natural physical world if physicalism is going to be true. And the problem of consciousness, what Chalmers calls the hard problem of consciousness, is the problem of finding the qualitative features of experiences in the physical world. Mm -hmm. So if there's this identical version of me, physically identical, it behaves as I do, but it's not like anything to be it, it lacks a feature that I have, and that's the source of, of the challenge, because you can't locate the feature I have in physical space. Right, so those guys, those things that are allegedly exactly like you in every physical respect, but don't have conscious experience at all. Philosophical zombies, as they're called. If those guys are possible, physicalism is false. Mm -hmm. Because you have a property that your physical duplicate wouldn't have. Right. So there but must see, be some property that isn't a physical property. See, here's the, here, here's the sense in which I think scientific materialism can't win. Is that, so... Uh, you're right. Wait, will you say exactly what you said again? The, the, that If philosophical zombies are possible, right. if there could be a thing that was physically like you in every respect but wasn't conscious, right. then physicalism is false. And if they're not possible, it seems to me scientific materialism is in trouble in another sense, which is the following, which is just that if you, uh, you know, there's two ways to look at this. I mean, let's just uh, start at, let, let, let's say, just the way we think of evolution, which I think is, you know, basically true. But the account is there's these physical molecules that start replicating. The ones that do the best job are favored. So it turns out the buildings, you know, cell walls is favored by natural selection. You get genes for that, blah, blah, blah. Ultimately, you get these super complex creatures. And, ac and, and according to the, just the fundamental theory of natural selection, you can account for all of the behavior in physical terms. That just like has to be the case. And to bring that up to the present world, uh, that means that, uh, and most I think behavioral scientists would think this is true, that, that when I get my hand too close to a fire and retract it, you can have a strictly physical account. Uh, all this evolved equipment, you know, involves, uh, there are sensors on my fingers, physical information gets sent up my arm and so on. So, so, uh, you, you, you know, in theory, the machinery should work without me feeling the pain, without it being like anything to be me. And if that's not the case, right, if it's not this physical system, then somewhere in the account, in the account I just gave you, we have a serious problem, right? So it seems to me that scientific materialism is in trouble either way. The only hope for the materialist... And it's one that I, you know, I don't think it's a, an entirely uh, vain hope, is to find something in that causal sequence, in your brain. Some, not some micro event, but some largish sort of event that plays a role in between 
the activation of your sensory neurons in your finger when you get too close to the flame, and the activation of your motor neurons when you pull your hand out of the flame. Somewhere in between, something happens in your brain that also happens when you get stuck with a pin, and that also happens when you stub your toe, and that also happens when you get a headache. If there's a physical thing, some, um, something that could, in principle, be identified in neurophysiological terms or in structural terms mm -hmm. that is plausibly identified with the pain. If the physicalist can say, I'm not denying the existence of pain, I've found it. I have told you what feature of physical reality pain is. It's this one. If they can make compelling identifications like that, then there's no tension between scientific materialism and the existence of consciousness, just as there's no tension between scientific materialism and the existence of life. Right? So, so some things are alive and others aren't. Mm -hmm. Right? Rocks aren't. Hamsters are. That's a line we draw. But as we now think, to be alive is just to have a set of fairly complicated, high-level capacities to metabolize uh, energy sources in the environment, to self-regulate, to maintain shape, to maintain form, to maintain other um, mm -hmm. processes characteristic of life and so on. It's not a deep mystery how something that was ultimately made up of inanimate, unthinking matter could have those high-level capacities. And that's what life is, so there's no tension between the existence of life and physicalism. If consciousness turned out to be like that, the mystery would go away. Well, I'm not sure though. W weren't you the, so? So the the account that the physicalist res resorts to, uh, your your as a last resort here, is doesn't that isn't that a purely still a purely deterministic account? I mean, I certainly grant that there that that uh, there are physical events that correlate with my feeling of pain. They may be generic uh, in some sense, and so yeah, it's the same thing when a pin sticks me, and when you know uh, when when my hands in a flame. But 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 it is still it is still a purely deterministic and mechanical account we're talking about, right? So, right, so yeah, go ahead. Right. So if pain, for example, just is a complicated brain state. Right. Okay. So then, then pains are caused physiologically, and they have their effects physiologically. So you're talking about kind of the mind-brain identity position, right? Yeah, but that, that is unintelligible to me, so I dismiss it. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, and I'm not alone, right? I, I mean, I mean uh, and the, thing, the whole thing about the issue of consciousness, mind-body problem, is like, it's one of these areas where it's such a fundamental issue, apparently, that when people disagree, sometimes it's not just that they disagree. It's like they don't even understand what the other person is talking about. And when they say these mind brain and, and is, I don't know, is Dennett currently kind of in this, this realm of uh, mind brain identity, Dan Dennett. I, I'm not sure if he is, but I just don't to say it. They're one in the same um, is. I, I don't, I almost literally don't understand what they're talking about to say that my subjective experience is the same as the physical thing because because you can see the physical thing, Gideon. You can look into my brain and see the physical thing. You cannot look into my brain and see the subjective experience. Ergo, they cannot be the same thing. That way of putting it begs the question against the materialist who likes this sort of view. <laughs> so um, they would say, but anyway, elaborate on their dubious position. <laughs> um, I think it's a good well, sign that it's, a, taking you, that it's taking you longer to think to formulate the sentences. I take I take that to mean that I'm 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 I am ascendant in this in this argument. But go ahead. Yeah, Wittgenstein thought that in certain kinds of philosophical conversation, the question that ought to be at the front of your mind is what sort of medicine does my interlocutor need? That is, I've got a. <laughs> it's not. Yeah. It's not what sort of argument do you need, what sort of evidence do you need, it's what, what, what's the right turn of phrase that will jolt you into seeing that your confusion was a confusion. And, uh, I've I don't been looking for that exactly. medicine. There are people I want to give it to. <laughs> um, so I was trying to think of um, an analogy. 
Uh, oh, you want to give it to me? You want to give the medicine to me? I want to uh, <laughs> try on that's hopeless. the hat of the reductive materialist. I, I just, I should say, I don't have a view about this. It's not like I have in my back pocket some vindication of reductive materialism. Mm-hmm. Um, I do find the worldview on which reductive materialism is false, and there are these other qualities unknown and unknowable to physics strewn throughout at least some parts of the natural world, these subjective qualities that are only accessible from the inside. That's weird, too. Oh, it's all weird. It's It's definitely weird, yeah. yeah. So materialism is hard to believe. So is the alternative. Or hard to understand. So is the alternative. Well, the the alternative is hard to conceive. But I do think I have a clear conception of why the materialism is in the senses I've described inadequate. I feel clear on that. I don't feel I have a clear view of the alternative. Yeah. The materialist picture is something like, this is a rough analogy. Imagine um, some aliens who never who live in a world where there is no water, let's suppose. An arid world where somehow they get by without uh, liquid water, but they have chemistry, so they've concocted a theory which allows them to describe this stuff that may exist on other planets at the molecular level. So they have a detailed um, quantum chemistry description of H2O and how it would behave and so on. Then they come to a wet planet like this, they start stepping in puddles and this, so on, and they say, what's this stuff? We've never seen anything like this before. And it takes them a while to realize that the stuff they're bouncing around in is the stuff they've been studying for years under another name, under another description, H2O rather than water. According to the materialist, that's how it is with the consciousness in the material world. We have two ways of thinking about it. We can think about it in the ordinary way as the feature we're acquainted with when we um, step on a rock, the pain we feel. And then there's this other description of the very same phenomenon in the language of uh, neuroscience or whatever it is. And it may take us a while to realize that it is one the same phenomenon that we're describing in two different vocabularies. That's what the materialist thinks would vindicate his view. That's sort of what happened with life and with other high level phenomena that were accommodated within the physicalist worldview. They think that that could happen with consciousness. Yeah, I still, it still does seem to me that just, uh, it should be the case that if two things are exactly the same, any feature one has, the other should have. Oh, yes. And, and, the, and the physical workings of my brain, an outsider can observe in principle, and, and the subjective experience correlated with that, they cannot observe. So, so sub- subjective experience has a feature that is not shared by the physical working of the brain. Yeah, and you know how this goes, the materialist is just gonna say, it's not true that an external observer cannot come to know the qualitative features of your subjective experience. They can, it's just that the description they give of them will be more like the chemist's description of water than like the everyday description of water. They're knowing the same features. Yeah, but but that, that's not the experience I'm having, believe me, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I feel water. <laughs> anyway, yeah. okay, so does that now now This I, is the impasse. This is the impasse. Yeah. As so often the impasse is that I'm right and they're wrong. I don't know why it always winds up like that. It's weird. <laughs> uh so um and you're agnostic. Yeah. yeah. I am. Um so uh there's I wanted to touch on uh, teleology, uh, but I think you said at one point when I was talking to you, not in this conversation, but at some point we were talking about how physicalism, it's, it's become more and more, you know, kind of complicated at best. Uh, and and I, I was like, so what do people really mean when they're physicalists? I, I, maybe I'm wrong. I thought you said it's almost like an identifier. It's almost a way of saying I'm not a moral realist and I'm not teleological, meaning I don't believe there's purpose in the world, certainly larger purpose. Am I misremembering or would you have said something like that? 
Yeah, I do think that's part of it. I mean, a whole bunch of things emerged together at the beginning of the 17th century with the scientific mm -hmm. revolution. One was the rise of mechanistic physics as a fundamental theory of reality. Another, and these were not exactly the same thing, was the rejection of teleology in nature. The idea that the apt description of nature is in terms of the purposes of things, the functions of things, or the goods that are to be realized by physical processes. Mm -hmm. Those two things, um, the rejection of teleology and the rise of um, mechanistic physics, happened at the same time with many of the same people involved. Though there were people who were impressed by mechanistic, who were impressed by a certain version of physics, who retained an interest in certain forms of teleology, like Leibniz. So that wasn't uh, exactly, but anyway, um, by the time the scientific revolution was mature, um, to be a hard-headed, scientifically-minded philosopher or theorist was to hold that fundamental physics involves mathematical properties of extended things spread out in space and time and not moral properties, not functions, not purposes, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And not, by the way, also, I mean, anything outside of nature that might have endowed physical things with that kind of purpose, like God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you're a materialist or a physicalist now, you reject fundamental teleology and you also reject the supernatural that might have explained well, fundamental teleology. It seems teleology. to me that, the, um, that a problem with that worldview, well, there's two problems. There's, first of all, the fact that uh, we speak of... Uh, you know, a, 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 a clock is having a purpose. Uh, it, is a, it is a purely physical system. So certainly you can imagine something where, you know, there's a physical system that has a purpose, but we don't have to think of the purpose as residing in the system in some sense that displaces the material stuff or competes with it for space. We can think of the the purpose is, is almost having to do with the nature of its historical development and not being in the system. So, so there, 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 there. Now I understand that you could, uh, acknowledge that. Say, okay, the universe could have a purpose in that sense, but we do not, we just don't think that there was some kind of deistic God that imparted, you know, as a matter of belief. I can see that. Um, although I would say that I think one kind of, current in thought that that might lend uh, it, not necessarily in a logical way but might might have the effect of lending legitimacy to the view of, of this kind of purpose in the universe is all this stuff about living in a simulation right it's like there are serious philosophers and and plus elon musk for what that's worth <laughs> <laughs> who say that we may be living i mean maybe i shouldn't mention him that that may mm -hmm. some people may may think that, that 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 doesn't work to the credit of this argument but um the uh who say that hey maybe we live in a simulation it's like um and 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 it's logically possible to me that doesn't seem to be like the craziest idea i've heard but in any event that is kind of taking taken seriously and if that's the case then it's an example of something where a, you know, a, a, a system that looks to us like a physical functioning regularly in accordance with law system clearly does have a, a, a purpose that was imparted, right? Right. So there are two models for how something gets a purpose. One is the model of the artifact. So the clock is made by a clockmaker. Mm -hmm. He's got a certain goal in mind, and if he achieves that goal with the clock, to some extent, then it's the function of the clock, the purpose of the clock, to you know, tell the time. Um, so on the version of the simulation hypothesis that you were describing, all of physical reality as we know it could be an artifact in that sense. That's what a version of that hypothesis says. Um, it's a funny sort of artifact. I mean, the simulation view is that what the simulators did was made a, they made a computer or some device like that. That was a physical device of more or less the sort that we know about. Mm -hmm. And by running an extremely complicated program, the simulation device conjured into existence an image, the simulated things. Now, look, when you run a computer simulation of some, you know, 
of a forest fire, to use one of Searle's old examples. You're seeing, you want to know how forest fires work, so you write a computer program which has elements that correspond to elements of the fire and um, laws that correspond to the laws by which fires evolve and so on. You run the program and you get information about how some fire might evolve. As we normally think, running that program doesn't conjure a fire into existence. There is no fire there at all. Right. The program is just a false representation. It's a, it's a fiction. Mm -hmm. and nothing corresponds to it. What the proponents of simulation think is that when the simulation gets good enough and complicated enough, by simulating a world of people like you and me sitting in front of computers talking to one another, you somehow conjure into existence things that really are like that. So it's not as if there is, there are no, mm -hmm. there is no you, there is no me, there is no microphone. All of those things are in some sense part of the world, according mm -hmm. to the simulation theorists. It's just that they are images produced by an underlying complex representational process. That's really weird. I agree that if we can make sense of the idea of a computational process conjuring objects into existence, then it is a slightly crazy, but not utterly crazy speculation that we and the objects we know about are like that. Right. I mean, but this brings us back to idealism in the sense that all we can say for sure is that to us, this seems like real fire. I mean, of course it does. We're the ones who labeled it fire. You know, it, it, it's like, I, I mean, I, I mean, ultimately, you, you, you're back to this very challenging question of what is subjective experience? Why is it here? What's its relationship to reality? But I guess one thing I'd say is, to me, like, the more you think about materialism and all this stuff, the more you realize that well, not only, yeah, for all we know, that is the case, that there's some computational machine generating these things that give us these impressions, but what is the practical difference between that and anything else we could say from our point of view, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, while we're on this um, slightly wild stuff, it's not as if we couldn't start getting evidence for some version of the simulation hypothesis or the dream hypothesis. Things are humming along pretty smoothly now, but if you started to... <laughs> speak, for, speak for yourself, but go ahead. <laughs> um, if you started to um, detect intimations that um, there was a kind of creative intelligence behind the unfolding course of events that you couldn't find in the unfolding course of events. You know, the kinds of um, coincidences. I mean, someone could just sort of peel back the curtain and start saying, you can't see me, but you can hear me. And I'm telling you, I wrote the program that you are a part of. You know, the, that kind of thing, I guess, could happen. And you'd think you were losing your mind. But that you is, could also that start is what getting, we say about people who say things like that, yes, that they are yeah. losing their mind. But you can also start getting subtler, more interesting intimations, um, like the intimations that you get in dreams, that there's more going on than could be going on if the only intelligences in reality were the intelligences that we see. Yeah. You know, I, I'm a pretty... Uh, well-rounded sort of guy. But I have time for the idea that that sort of thing is not that remote from actual experience. And if that started happening, all bets are off as to what the possibilities are for the source of that kind of meaning and experience. Could be Geek sitting at some computer terminal in another reality simulating a world like ours could be something funkier than that. Pretty weird. Uh, just a couple of quick things. One is super quick. It's just that, I, I, as you know, uh, I have this view that one reason that, 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 that the process of evolution itself could be purposive and yet strictly physical, as I believe right. it. I, I believe, you know, I'm a Darwinian. I believe it is. Uh, 
But the purpose could have been imbued in principle in a couple of ways. And, and by the way, the argument, it isn't the kind of thing you're talking about uncanny coincidences. It's just that if you look at the system unfold, actually, it looks very much like the unfolding of an organism and, 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 and uh, all the other things that look like that. We say not we're designed by an intelligent designer, but at least we're created by this process of natural selection and, and imbued with, if not purpose, at least purpose in quotes, goals and so on. And I'm saying so, you know, and, and in theory, natural selection. So it could be simulation, designer, you know, could be God, but could just be some kind of meta natural selection involving the birth of universes. Enough about that. People have heard that. People have heard that. You've heard it. No one wants to hear it. Uh, but there's this other thing. This is more in line of what, with what you were saying. I once said to my, you know, I was talking about the dream scenario, I guess, with one of my daughters. And I said, you know, it just seems like, like, what are the chances that I'd be this lucky, right? Like, if I'm just, it's like I'm living at this time, this fascinating time when the world is kind of coming together. There's... Uh, there's all this, this uh, you know, knowledge out there. I'm privileged to be in this particular place. I get to do this. I get to do that, you know, and think about these things and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, I'm not one of the many other people that have been born. It just seems, you know, uh, in, 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 in dark, the dark ages and blah, 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 and people who have no advantages and no opportunities and no education. And she said, well, yeah, but if you weren't one of these people, you wouldn't be asking this question. Was it now? Was that an effective dismissal in your view? <laughs> if you didn't have the privileged position, you wouldn't be entertaining this question. It's a lot like the anthropic principle, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I do think that's sort of effective. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry to hear that. It's bad for both of us. You could make the same argument. Yeah, I mean, it's not. Um, an antidote to a related thought. There's the, how come I'm so lucky to be living at a moment when the possibility of this kind of um, coming to self-consciousness of the universe mm -hmm. is possible? Because that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. you know, over the course of relatively recent human history, in this ridiculously small corner of the universe, um, uh, people are thinking the... Are, People who are bits of the universe are in a position to think about the universe as a whole and to frame non-crazy intelligent hypotheses about... So the universe has come to, in this highly provisional way, understand itself just recently in cosmic time. Right. I'm not sure how much mileage you get out of the question, how come we're so lucky to be living now? But there is the question, why did that happen at all? Isn't well, there that. you go. I mean, that's there. You're getting back to my first point about the, there are just aspects of the unfolding of life that are so amazing that they raise questions. You know, it, it does seem to be a kind of directional uh, movement toward awareness of the universe. You know, some some evolutionists said that evolution is the universe becoming aware of itself. It, it does. You know, if you told some alien, look, see, this is a system that it's sure it starts out with just two replicating strand, you know, a, a replicating strand of information. But as you see it unfold, you can see, actually, it's an algorithm for the universe coming to understand itself. They would go, ah, that seems like a pretty good algorithm. You know, it, it's like th that's what I mean. That That's amazing. That's one thing I mean. I agree that that's amazing. And uh unless you can tell some general story about how generically, if you start with the raw ingredients for natural selection um, and things hum off for a long enough period of time, you're likely to get this kind of self-awareness. If that's not a generic feature of evolutionary processes, then the fact that we have one of the special case evolutionary processes huh. that spat out that kind of self-awareness is a fact that as uh, it's sometimes put, cries out for explanation. Not every amazing fact needs an explanation. Sometimes things just happen, and we can live with the idea that there's no story about why. But that's a pretty amazing fact. See, I would have taken it in the other direction, uh, in the sense that, I mean, I've made the argument that, uh, um, uh, and we can link to one of my arguments, I guess, but um, the, the, uh, that uh, actually natural selection, barring catastrophe, was likely to get eventually given long enough to uh, intelligent life, fairly likely. And there's some biologists who agree. And I would say 
that's the reason to think that the original self-replicating DNA is kind of like the seed of a flower or the egg uh, for an organism in the sense that the rest is a natural unfolding. And when you see something like that, you go, wait a second, this demands a special explanation. With animals, the special explanation is natural selection. I'm saying, what is the explanation for natural selection itself? And, uh, and I'm not saying that if you had that explanation, you'd have the ultimate explanation. That might just push the question back you know, one turtle, so to speak, back. The turtle's all the way down. But um, uh, so, so it's interesting that you could take it in either direction. You're saying, weren't we lucky? This is amazing luck. And I guess somebody could throw the anthropic principle objections at you in, in reply. But I mean, I guess we're agreeing. It's yeah, that version of the anthropic argument is lousy. Oh, it's is it? It seems to me... Um, if it's antecedently unlikely that you'll get conscious things, and you ask the question, so why did we get them? And someone says, oh, if you hadn't gotten them, you wouldn't be asking this question. That right. does nothing at all to demystify the fact that we did get the amazing unlikely outcome. I don't like that version of the anthropic argument at all. Oh, okay. Well, this is maybe we've, maybe we've gotten to something that's a whole nother, uh, yeah. if I can ever convince you to come back again, that could be a whole nother conversation starter, the anthropic principle. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff too. I mean, just quickly, is the teleology question in your mind inherently related to the moral realism question? Uh, I mean, I mean, one scenario, I'm trying to, I, it's, it's sometimes hard for me to imagine, like, what does it mean to say that moral truths are, are in some sense out there, that they're in some sense real? Maybe in the simulation scenario, you could, you could say, well, if the programmer set up the game, such that, let's say such that to survive, humankind has to develop these moral ideas, which I actually think may be the case. Um, would that be a form of moral realism? Because uh, they were, you know, instantiated in the system as truths that must be arrived at to, you know, uh, I don't know. What, 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 I'll stop now. What, yeah. what, do you have anything to say about moral realism and or teleology? Right. So natural teleology, the kind of teleology that emerges in, um, say, ordinary evolution, where you get you know, the function of the heart is to pump blood because that's what the mm -hmm. heart was selected for. Mm -hmm. That kind of teleology has no normative force. The fact that it's the function of this or that to do this or that mm -hmm. um, just entails nothing at all about how we ought to behave with respect to it. Right? So suppose I've got some impulse whose natural teleology is to, uh, you know, Take some impulse to sexual violence in men, which may, if the evolutionary psychologists are right, be real and exist as a result of some evolutionary whatnot. The fact that it's there and has an evolutionary purpose just entails nothing at all about how we ought to act. Right. So the kinds of um, moral features that are of interest to the moralist couldn't emerge all by themselves from that kind of natural teleology. So if you're a real moral realist, you should think, there are moral constraints on what we ought to do, how it would be good to act, and so on, that aren't grounded in that kind of function or purpose. I'm not sure they're grounded in functions or purposes at all. Okay. I mean, they're grounded in values. That is, things that are things that matter, things that are worth promoting, things that are worth doing. Right. Um, okay. That's another place. Nice nice. That's yeah. another place we could pick up the conversation because I'm tempted to say something that will lead to a whole nother uh, strand of discussion. Um, well, anyway, this has been great. Uh, I, I think it confirms my claim that you're an incredibly efficient uh, source of uh, insight into various things. Uh, I mean, we've covered a lot of ground, and I think in reasonably comprehensible fashion. Um, we'll see. should, should uh, you know, you've written like a billion papers. Uh, are there any of them that, that uh, you would steer people toward? One thing I, I saw that you gave a talk, uh, moral outrage is a political emotion. That's also a, a whole nother conversation um, at, at the Human Values Forum in Princeton. That may be online. Any, anything else you'd steer people toward? You know, it's a sort of, it's a regret of mine that so much of what I write is really written for the insiders. So it's not so... Um, you know, it sort of starts in the middle of things and isn't so user-friendly. Um, if people want to look at something that I think is 
uh, accessible and worth reading. So I'm the editor of the, uh, and editor of the Norton Introduction to Philosophy. Okay. This is a textbook for use in like introductory college philosophy classes, but we put it together in the hopes that people who are just curious about philosophy would pick it up and start reading. It contains selections from classic materials, selections from, uh, recent philosophy, specially invited papers by big shot experts in philosophy that are supposed to be intelligible to a beginning student, that is to anyone at all, and also lots of um, editorial material, stuff written by me and the other editors, designed to make the problems of contemporary philosophy um, as clear and vivid as they can be. So if someone wants to pull the Norton Introduction to Philosophy off the Amazon shelf, that's not a bad place to start. Okay, so we will link to that on Amazon. The place we link, I mean, a lot of people are listening to this as an audio podcast. Some are watching it on YouTube. The place we link is on the meaningoflife.tv site. If they go to this video, there's a, 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 a thing that says links mentioned, and if they click on that, then they are there. Of course, in this particular case, they may be resourceful enough that they could get to this book on Amazon without doing all that. I give, I give some of our listeners and viewers that much credit. Well, thank you so much, Gideon. This has been great, and I hope I'll be able to uh, lure you back here again. Thanks, Bob.